All right. Good evening, folks. Uh, my name is Dr. Purush Babar, um, and thanks so much for tuning in today to, uh, I think, this very important and timely session on an important topic in men's health that that uh, we we want to stress and emphasize here at the Urology Group and really strive to provide world class care on for for uh, this condition. So I'm going to give it maybe another minute, minute and a half uh, while people uh, trickle in, but we'll get going real soon. So thank, thanks so much for, for tuning in. Really appreciate it. So uh, the topic for tonight's discussion will be erectile dysfunction, uh, the management of it, uh, how we diagnose it, and, and some uh, innovative uh, new solutions we have for it. And, and uh, you know, we're going to really cover it from uh, the beginnings of, of the process to, you know, what we would say is end stage erectile dysfunction and, and how we can help patients regain this part of their, uh, their life. So. Um, my name is Dr. Purush Babar. Uh, I, I grew up in Melbourne, Australia, uh, and I moved uh, to the U.S. for high school uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and then I went to Wake Forest for my undergrad and medical school degree. Uh, I had a great eight years there. And then I think one of the, the best and luckiest things that happened in my career, I matched at what I think is the preeminent urologic institution in the country, the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, and over there, uh, spent six years doing my residency uh, saw a very wide gamut of urology from ranging from stones, female urology, kidney transplantation, cancer, you know, the, all of it. But the thing that always stuck with me was men's health, prosthetics and, and reconstructive procedures and just really helping men um, regain parts of their life that that sometimes they, they think they've lost and, and they can't get back. So uh, you, once again, just a lot of lot of uh, luck and, and just hard work. And I, I was able to stay on for a fellowship uh, just a whole year dedicated to this with with uh, two of the greatest mentors, Dr. Angermeyer and Dr. Wood, who really took me under their wing and, and taught me everything. And uh, so so now I've uh, been in Cincinnati a little while and I've, I've tried to bring a lot of these cutting edge techniques that 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 uh, were, were inculcated at the Cleveland Clinic uh, over over here. So here are, are some of the specialties that we see besides that I see besides erectile dysfunction, testicular pain, uh, urethral reconstruction. So, you know, uh, ha happy to, uh, you know, be a sounding board and, and someone that that patients can can see for some complex issues. And I, I see patients out of our main Norwood location and, and on the east side and Eastgate. So what is erectile dysfunction? Uh, who has it? What causes it? So simplistically speaking, erectile dysfunction um, is the inability to achieve or maintain an erection firm enough for sexual intercourse. So the key in this definition is that uh, it's a very subjective thing. So for, for, what, for one man, what may be, they're, they're fine with that erection and, and how intimacy is for them, another may or may not be. And, and, and so that's part of the discussion that, that I have with patients on how we can um, go ahead and, and, and help them. And so erectile dysfunction is extremely common. One in five American men over the age of 20 will experience ED in their lifetime. Um, approximately 40% of men over the age of 40 will have it, which kind of uh, a lot of times will surprise patients. I have younger patients who come in and, you know, they're, they're healthy. And this may be one of the first things that, that you know, it go, go, goes uh, by the wayside. So it is it is extremely common. And, and there's some estimates that approximately 30 million American men are affected. So the key that, that I stress here is that that you are not alone. And, and taking ownership of, of your health as a man as a man is absolutely critical. Um, females are, are 
just better and more intuitive in, in seeing their doctors taking ownership of their health. And, and as men, we, we do a not as good of a job. We tend to bury our head in the sand, little macho. And so I think that the, just tuning into this, this webinar tonight, I really commend everyone. And I think, you know, this, this, this is a great first step in, in addressing what, what is a very, very, very common problem. This is, you know, I, I see 30 patients a day with very similar complaints. So, so you're not alone by any means. Um, and so how an erection works, essentially there's blood flow in and there's blood flow out. And if there's uh, not enough blood flow in or more blood flow leaves the penis than comes in, you have erectile dysfunction, simplistically speaking. So what, what this talks about is there, and also nerves do play a part, you know, arousal will stimulate the nerves, the muscles around the arteries will relax, which allows arterial inflow of blood. And then once the arteries engorge, these will compress the veins because those are a little more elastic and then blood can't leave the penis. So the simplistically speaking, if there is a um, issue with arterial inflow, venous outflow, or the nerves as well that stimulate uh, the the erection, then, then we can see uh, issues with erectile dysfunction. So, so essentially common causes of erectile dysfunction uh, medications, some anti-psychiatric uh, medications, depression medications can do it. Some cancer treatments obviously can uh, decrease testosterone levels that can affect uh, erections. Then pelvic surgery is a big cause uh, if someone's had a big colon resection or prostate removal, sometimes bladder removal, these things, the, the, the nerves that uh, control your erections go there. Uh, diabetes is a the, a, a very big cause of erectile dysfunction because diabetes can not only affect the arteries and veins, but can also affect the nerves from the increased sugars in the blood. They cause dysfunction in the inner lining of the blood cells and the, and the nerves. And then uh, radiation therapy for, for cancer is a, is a huge uh, cause of erectile dysfunction. Um, and, then, and then absolutely, I think that depression, anxiety, um, Psychogenic causes are, 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 are a preeminent cause of erectile dysfunction and something that, that we, we, you know, like to explore when we see patients. Uh, and then uh, heart issues as well. So sometimes when I see a young male who comes in and, and they're healthy, but they uh, have erectile dysfunction, I, I may uh, eva I recommend an evaluation with a cardiologist because once in a while, erectile dysfunction can be the first sign of a underlying heart condition. And so the, the, the same issue that's causing not enough blood to get to the penis, the small vessels in the heart can also have some, some plaque buildup that's, that's uh, not allowing good blood flow. And, and so, you know, that's what inevitably can cause a heart attack. So, so I, I will send them to the cardiologist and this, this is something uh, that, that is in our guidelines and, and we stress as well. So there's a multitude of causes that 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 can uh, lead up to erectile dysfunction and that's part of uh, our job as urologists to kind of parse through that so uh ways to reduce your risk I, th this uh, everyone's heard from from elementary school you know all our teachers doctors primary care will talk about this so your diet is absolutely critical exercising maintaining a healthy weight uh, less visceral fat more uh, you know, the better BMI, limiting alcohol is critical. Smoking, I mean, is is very bad for your erections because it it, it really affects the blood vessels. Uh, and 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 quitting smoking, I mean, if, if if nothing will stop someone, if if you know, getting your erections back or better will, then please quit smoking. Best thing you can do for your overall health. Uh, reducing stress, I mean, it's a difficult time right now in the world with COVID. And so I th I've seen a lot more erectile dysfunction in younger patients, I think, from stress, anxiety, depression, and um, and then and then sleep is, is absolutely critical as well. So other causes of erectile dysfunction that, that I, I want to, you know, really uh, just dive a little deeper into that, that are more urologically pertinent. So low testosterone. So uh, as, as, as men age, four in 10 men over the age of 45 may have a low testosterone. So when I see a man with new onset erectile dysfunction, this is one part of the evaluation. Like, do you have low uh, sex drive? Have you been putting on more weight, losing muscle mass, having issues with concentration? Um, fatigue. And so that's something that our guidelines will talk about that we would a lot of times want to check uh, a testosterone level because sometimes uh, repleting testosterone can be an underlying cause of erectile dysfunction and uh, can, can, you know, help augment or whatever treatments we do for ED. 
Um, then Peyronie's disease. So th this is where you uh, patients may have seen some uh, commercials on Hulu, I think is, is big on this. So uh, they have the, these um, gr bell peppers that are bent and carrots that are bent. So this is an adult onset acquired penile curvature. So it's very common, about 9 to 13% of men over the age of 50 will have it. And we think it's because when you're having sex with an erection that is uh, not as rigid as, it, rigid as it should be, let's say, you know, an eight out of 10, and there's just a little bit of hinging in the erection that is imperceptible to the partner and the patient. There can be some micro trauma in the inside lining of the penis. And then these nine to 13% of patients who get Peyronie's can have scar tissue deposition in the penis. And then that scar tissue is not as elastic and it hooks the penis. So you get a little bit of a curve to the penis. So it's, and this is vastly undertreated uh, because men just think, okay, I, I don't know what this is, but I don't want to talk about it. But I think we, we have some treatments for it. And um, a lot of times Peyronie's goes hand in hand with erectile dysfunction. So some of the treatments do overlap. And then another uh, condition that, that we as urologists treat a lot is prostate cancer. Um, and it's not the actual prostate cancer generally that's causing the erectile dysfunction, but some the, you know the treatments that um, the, the urologic oncologist uh, have to do to kind of save men's lives from the prostate cancer. So, uh, you know, whether it be surgery, radiation, or, or hormonal therapies for metastatic prostate cancer, these can all uh, cause uh, issues with, with erectile dysfunction. And, and we, we, we definitely look into that when we see patients for, for the condition. Um, so, so low testosterone, uh, your, your, the, a man's testicles are the preeminent source of uh, testosterone. And as we age, that it, it's, it's not uncommon that the amount of testosterone can be less. And, and we see some of the symptoms that, that I had uh, outlined previously and, and that are listed here. Um, and so it, it's important that, that if this is an issue, at least we have a discussion about repleting testosterone. And you know, part of it depends, is, is the man interested in fertility? But then if you're interested in having kids, there's a different way to replete it versus if you're not. And um, a lot of times, you know, treating the low testosterone can make uh, our treatments for erectile dysfunction just work better because you're really treating the underlying cause of, of, of what may be precipitating the, the erectile dysfunction. Um, so some of the treatment options, uh, if you're a candidate, is gels, solutions, alcohol-based solutions like hand sanitizer that we rub in. Uh, oral medications is a new one on the market called Jatenzo that uh, we, we give. And then there's a one that's a little off-label, but this is the one we use for patients who want fertility, Clomid, and that increases the precursors to testosterone and kind of kickstarts your own body trying to make a little more testosterone. There's newer nasal sprays, uh, that the that, testo that that work well patches pellets and then injections as well um, which generally sometimes we can say are last line but but work very well and, and have been around for a number of years and have stood the test of time so um, and, and actually at our pharmacy uh, in, in at, at the urology group we uh, provide this service where with uh, you know testosterone repletion we, we have a full service where uh, we, we will manage the the therapy that we deem best for you. And then, and then more importantly, it's all about monitoring the labs. You want to make sure that, you know, each patient will take a different dose and you don't want to overshoot because when you hear about some of the side effects with testosterone, such as heart attack, stroke, I think this is more related to when the, some of these low testosterone clinics that are not run by urologists, they'll just get you in every second, third day, shoot you with testosterone, not check labs. And when you get your testosterone levels super therapeutic. I mean, too much of, of a good thing can be a bad thing. And, and this is where we see this. If you take your testosterone into the thousands, yeah, you're going to feel great. You're going to bench press a ton, but then you're, you may die of a heart attack. So, so you need to, you know, it needs to be managed carefully. And that's, that's what we, we do through our lab just to, to stay on top of that with our pharmacy and, uh, and, and, and our, and our uh, group of, of uh, physicians assistants that we've trained up on, on this, and they do an excellent, excellent job. So um, going on to Peyronie's disease. So this is the adult onset acquired uh, penile curvature. Um, it's more common over the age of 50 years old, reason being that this is when you a lot of times start seeing erectile dysfunction, the beginnings of it. So it doesn't happen when a patient's say 20 years old because the erection's in a 12 out of 10. It's not going to have that micro tear in the penis and an 80 year old if untreated and they have a two out of 10 erection, it's not gonna happen. It's this eight out of 10 erection where there's just the micro tears in the inside lining of the penis that we start seeing Peyronie's uh, vastly, vastly undertreated. Um, and 
there's undoubtedly loss of length with erections because you know my fingers are the same length once one is curved now look there's a loss of length right so the the earlier we can sometimes treat this and 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 uh, prevent further curvature the better um and then they can at in the active phase right in the first six months or so pain with erections that we can help treat and then obviously like i said it it, it goes hand in hand many times with erectile dysfunction um, so some of the treatment options, there's devices, there's a device out of the Mayo Clinic in Rochester uh, made by Landon Trost called a Restorex device, which helps to essentially pull the penis back the other way. You use it uh, for a few months and, and data shows that there's about a 15 to 20 degree decrease in curvature uh, with this uh with this uh therapy then there's xyaflex so this uh, this also has commercials uh on, on on the tv that you'll see and so this is a a um an enzyme you inject directly into that fibrous plaque that you can see in that schematic and um it has a enzyme in it that breaks down collagen histolytinum collagenase and this uh can can over the course of about six to eight injections a lot of uh, you know help reduce the curve uh, on average about 17 to 25 degrees and then there's surgical options. Um, so penile plication, incision and excision and grafting of, of, of a plaque. And then, um, and, and so those two treatments are generally reserved for patients who have good erections, but Peyronie's. And then if you have concomitant uh, Peyronie's disease of the erectile dysfunction, a penile implant is generally your, your, your best bet to straighten the penis and give you a reliable rigid erection for intercourse. Prostate cancer. Um, so, so like I said, it's it's generally the treatments that are given for prostate cancer that uh, can precipitate some of the erectile dysfunction. But you know, I I, I you know I fully respect that that prostate cancer is the second most common cancer in men. It needs to be treated many times. And you know, if you don't have a life, you don't have an erection. So you know, you should not. Uh, hesitate for a second to undergo whatever treatment your oncologist thinks is, is best for you. And then we can deal with whatever comes. And, and a lot of times it's not, it's not a guarantee there's erectile dysfunction, but um, in, 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 you know, this study is saying 30 to 40% of patients after some type of treatment, you may get some erectile dysfunction. Uh, so these are some of the treatments that, that we, we see commonly for prostate cancer. And I've, I've seen erectile dysfunction from, from all of them uh, at various times. Um, so most types of erectile dysfunction can be treated. That is absolutely true. And so some of the treatment options kind of switching gears, uh, there's oral medications such as Viagra, Cialis. These are the most common ones. There's Levitra, Stendra. These are PD-5 inhibitors, and they increase blood flow to the penis. Vacuum erection devices. Uh, there's this uh, the Almaduo ultrasound wave therapy. So this is the new cutting-edge uh, technology that, that has uh, kind of... Uh, come through in the past few years that 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 we're going to dive deeper into that a lot of patients may not know about because the other things have been around a long time and then injections that you give yourself directly into the penis and then penile implants um, being the surgical option uh, for erectile dysfunction so um, oral medications uh, the viagra cialis uh, these medications the, through the nitric oxide synthase pathway will increase blood flow to the penis and they do require sexual stimulation you can't just take the the pill and 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 hope for the best i mean there, there has to be some uh stimulation with it it's effective in 50 to 85 percent of men and at first generally uh patients you know who have not had, let's say, a big colon resection where the nerves have been taken out. I mean, they will have some response. Um, but what we see is that over time, the dose may need to be increased. And then at a certain point, I mean, you hit the max dose and, you know, it may not work. And then we move on to other um, treatment options. And that, that can take a few years, you know, the, and some guys are on it, you know, for, for you know, decades. So so it's, it's it, it, and that fully depends. And I've seen it go every which way. But um and, and we, you know, this is very common if someone has hyper, uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, you may have to increase your lisinopril dose or your Genuvia dose, you know, so this is, this is a thing that our bodies do, sensitization, and then they get used to a certain dose of a medication and you need to take a little more over time. Um, the issue is that a lot of times the, 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 these medications can, can, are not covered by insurance uh, for the amount that it may be needed. Um, and, and that's something that, that, you know, the, patient and the insurance have to look into. Um, so potential side effects, because this is increasing blood flow to the penis, I and mean, it also increases blood flow 
for instance, to the head. So that's why you some patients can get it like a head rush or a headache, some facial flushing, nasal congestion. Um, and so uh, th those are some of the side effects that, that, that we can see with these medications. Um, so just going into the two most common ones that we as urologists will prescribe, one is Viagra or the generic name is Sildenafil. It takes about 30 to 60 minutes to work, uh, will last for about four hours, maybe a little less, and the you know should be taken on an empty stomach, generally speaking. Um, and then Cialis, they call it the weekend pill because it can last, they say, up to 36 hours. You should take it at least one hour before, I, I generally say two to four generally. And this one is not as dependent on food, which some patients like, uh, and there are daily and as needed op options note, uh, that are available. Um, people will say, which one do you recommend? And I, I would say that I have half my patients swear by one, half by the other. You know, some have side effects to one, some have it to the other. So, you know, sometimes we, we just, I, I go through both and whatever sounds more attractive, we start on that. If you don't like it, we go to the other. Um, and then, like I said, there are other options too, but these are generally the ones that um, we start with and, and are more apt to be covered uh, by insurance to make it uh, affordable. One other thing um, is our, that our pharmacy in Norwood, uh, we do stock uh, these medications and we actually bypass insurance. So uh, we, you know, for instance, I know the um, Sildenafil pills, we sell at 60 cents a pill. And so, you know, if you can get it cheaper at your pharmacy, I think that's very reasonable. But we, uh, I think our service is exceptional. Melissa Reuter, our uh, pharmacist is, is top notch and, and we have no waiting uh, in line. Uh, the prescriptions are mailed right to your home discreetly and you can always call and there's someone who will answer no membership costs like some of these uh, men's health clinics. Uh, and so, um, you know, so a, a, a very good service, you know, that we offer at the urology group is I, we, we pride ourselves on being, you know, an all inclusive and uh, service where we, you know, we do surgery at the center, we have a pharmacy, we, you know, have our own radiology, you know, I think we, we like to be able to, to offer a wide range of, 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 of um, uh, options for, for all conditions. Um, next, vacuum erection device. So, so this is a, um, let me just, it'll be easier if I show this. So there's a hollow plastic tube that's placed over the penis and essentially it, it provides suction. It can be hand or battery powered and it uh, pulls blood into the penis. And a lot of times, if you look at the base of the penis, there's that elastic ring, uh, like a rubber band that's put at the base to help kind of trap the blood there. And so uh, this this is what's called a vacuum erection device. It's been around for many years. And I have some patients who, who really swear by it and, and it works great for them. Um, it's, an, it's effective in 60 to 80 percent of men, um, but I would generally say that a lot of men will try it, but then they may just move on to other treatments because the lack of spontaneity is a bit of an issue. But you do have to get into it a little bit; it doesn't happen right away, and then there can be some discomfort or insufficient rigidity associated uh, with the with the with the device. Um, next, so there's a lot um, of of uh, things on in the media now of, of about penile shockwave, penile ultrasound wave therapy. So um, this has been a, been around for maybe about four or five years now. And uh, essentially, as a group of urologists, we waited and waited for the data to mature before we jumped into this. So there are places around town, not urologists. Okay, so as a urologist, I spent you know seven years training on which is weird to say the penis, the the testicles, the bladder, kidney, but the, this is run by you know just Tom, Dick, or Harry, and and they're offering ultrasound wave therapy or or penile shock wave around town. But we are the first group of urologists in Cincinnati who are doing this because I think we finally our men's health team said I think we can stand behind the data, and this is the uh, the Alma Duo machine uh, is is the one uh, that that we uh, picked because this is what has. Uh, the, the most of the, the randomized clinical trials. So a lot of the other machines, they, there's two types of penile shockwave or ultrasound wave therapy, okay? So essentially there's focal shockwave, which is what we are offering, which uh, penetrates deeper and has, has uh, been shown to cause stem cell proliferation, uh, blood vessel formation in the penis, um, and nerve cell regeneration. Now there's another type called radial. Now this, this type of shockwave is, is some of these other men's health clinics that are running. Um, and that doesn't need to be run by a urologist. Anyone can do it. Um, it's, it's in the same FDA class as a photocopy machine. So AK, you can't harm anyone. So 
anyone can run it. Um, and so there's, there's, and there's really no, there's no randomized clinical trials behind that. There's one study out of the Cleveland Clinic when I was there uh, that, that we had done that looked at both of these head to head. It was not randomized and it wasn't very promising results, but essentially, so I'm going to kind of go into what uh, the Alma Duo machine is focal shockwave and 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 essentially that I, what I think uh, has some good data behind it. So uh, the Alma Duo helps to restore natural erections, but it has to be in well selected patients. Um, and and so there's it's six quick fifteen minute in office treatments uh, with uh, this this uh, ultrasound wave therapy. There's actually in in all the randomized clinical trials that are coming out of Israel and Europe, uh, there was no real expected side effects such as blood collections in the penis, penile hematomas, urethral strictures, uh, really not no pain uh, was associated with it. And a lot of times patients could either eliminate their use of sildenafil or uh, Cialis or decrease the dose. Um, and it can be, sometimes be a, a longer lasting treatment for erectile dysfunction. Um, and if we, yeah, so this this is how it essentially works uh, for, for people who want to understand the mechanics. So it's a low intensity uh, shockwave therapy. So urologists, we've been using shockwave therapy since the mid 80s. Uh, I don't know if any of the people today in the in the audience have had kidney stones in the past. Uh, we do, they, they will put a probe on the back and we can shock stones. But it, the key for that too is it needs to be a well-selected patient. So I, if I see a patient who is a severe diabetic has had his prostate out and they took the nerves and the bladder and, you know, I'm not gonna offer this treatment to them. I don't think it's gonna work. What the data shows is that patients who have some response to Cialis or Viagra, that this can, the Alma Duo treatment can augment that and keep them on that treatment or eliminate the, the need for that longer. And so they don't have to progress to you know, the other thing, injection, penile implant. And so it needs, you know, it's all about patient selection. And, and that's, that's I think, what we, we stress. So the therapist will treat multiple areas on the penis with the Alma Duo. And this is all based on all these randomized clinical trials uh, that, that, that have uh, come out. Um, and it's clinically validated to stimulate better blood flow. Uh, and in Europe, interestingly, so as urologists, we have guidelines that we follow. Um, and in Europe, in the European uh, Urologic Association guidelines, it is actually now in the first line therapy, right there with Viagra, Cialis, vacuum erection device, and penile shockwave, focal penile shockwave is covered. So in, in Europe, it, it's it's there. And I think at some point in the United States, the FDA and AUA may have may be doing this too. So uh, this, will, this will be interesting. So um, now we're gonna have just a little animation on, um, the, the the penile shockwave. So we're going to just show that now. <clears throat> so as you can see, uh, this is the the handheld piece that uh, delivers the ultrasound wave therapy. And there's uh, certain um, locations on the penis that that we uh, shock, and that is based on all the studies, like I said. Um, and essentially, what you have to realize is the penis is like an iceberg. So what you see on the outside, there's also some on the inside. And so we we get some of that, what's called the crura of the penis. And this helps to, uh, like I said, stimulate some blood flow, nerve cell regeneration, stem cell proliferation in the penis. So, um, yeah. So like I said, um, I think we're very proud of this. We're the first group of urologists in Cincinnati offering the ultrasound wave therapy. And as, as uh, stewards of the penis, I think that, that that speaks volumes. I think that we stand behind this treatment in well-selected patients. And we have, since October, been doing it and had some, some very good results in, in well-selected patients. Um, we have a staff of, of, of experts with decades of experience that, that uh, um, help with this. Uh, and like I said, we, we really look into the history and, and what your response to Viagra and Cialis is, or you know, where you are in this continuum of erectile dysfunction. Um, and it's like I said, it's backed by multiple randomized controlled trials and approved in in guidelines in 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 certain countries, which is great. Um, and one question that people ask is it covered by insurance? I think that's always the elephant in the room. So in Europe, generally, because it's in the guidelines, it is in the United States. Unfortunately, at this time, it is not. So um, the pricing on on this, uh, because I, I know that's already coming through as a question, um, is. Uh, 
for, for each treatment, it's uh, $400 and there's six treatments. So if, if I think they say, if you pay for the first uh, pay up front, you can pay for $2,000 for six treatments. You get the, the six treatment free. So, um, and this is uh, how to get started. This is a QR code. If, if you want to not uh, jot that down, if anyone's interested and there's the, the phone number and we will offer a free uh, consultation online uh, with one of our providers just to see if you're even a, a candidate. If not, we're not going to waste your time uh, with it and then um, start treatment after that. Okay, next. So injections into the penis. Um, so this has been around for, for many years. Um, so in, in patients who generally maybe fail uh, Viagra, Cialis, ultrasound wave therapy, vacuum devices, the, the last step before a surgical procedure generally is injections into the penis. So uh, a small uh, amount of uh, medicine is, is injected directly into the penis. And this really helps to uh, bring blood flow into the penis and and. 60% um, of men, I think even maybe a little higher, can, can see success with this. Um, it, to, you have to kind of keep it on ice uh, and, and in the freezer a lot of times. So it's a little cumbersome to the spontaneity is probably what I think patients have the most issue with. And then also the, the thought of putting a needle in one's penis. But um, uh, the reasons that patients will seek alternatives, pain, you can have development of scar tissue, then the, the prolonged erection. So you, you may hear this when you see the Viagra commercials on, on the TV. If you have an erection lasting longer than four hours, see your uh, doctor. So I, that certainly can happen with Viagra, but it's more common with the injections because it's just a more potent dose that goes directly in the penis. It's not like a pill going all throughout. And um, so, so those are that, and this is how it works. You know, you self inject, and as you can see, that that schematic is showing you put it into the side of the penis, was the 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 nerves and the urethra are not there, and then five to twenty minutes after, you get a nice rigid erection. And uh, there's a few specialized pharmacies um, that that provide this. Uh, we do not have this in our pharmacy, but we 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 can um, you know direct patients if if they're a candidate to to an appropriate pharmacy. And then. Um, Last but not least, so so penile implants. So interestingly, penile implants have been around over four decades, which which uh, longer than Viagra, which is which uh, surprises many of my patients. So um, this is a surgical treatment, um, and this is how this works. So there's um, two types of penile implants. The the one that's been around over four decades is a malleable penile implant. So it's these rods that we surgically emplace into the two erection chambers of the penis called the corpus cavernosum. And you essentially can just move those up and down. And then the, the Cadillac or the, you know, the one that we do majority of cases is an inflatable penile prosthesis. And this is this schematic here. So it's a fluid filled system. There's two cylinders again that are in the penis. There's a pump in the scrotum and a reservoir that we tuck in the abdomen that's up there. And so essentially um, when you wanna have sex, you just locate that um, pump that's in the scrotum. You squeeze that momentary squeeze pump and it pulls the fluid from that reservoir into the implant. And then when you're done, if you can see that little notch right here, that's um, on the top of the implant, you press that, and that is, is a valve that releases the fluid from the cylinders back into the um, back into the reservoir. Um, this this therapy, uh, you know, works exceptionally well uh, in well selected patients um, because it takes a lot of the um, the issues with spontaneity or, you know, you one day Viagra works, the other day it doesn't, or, you know, so, so this, this, you know, is, 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 will work, you know, every time essentially, unless there's an issue and, and it's reliable and you can keep it as hard for as long as you want generally. And um, we, 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 you know, I, I last year did over 70 of these uh, in my practice alone. And, you know, my, my other partners did some too. So essentially, I mean, this is something that I think, Men have a bit of a when I, when when I, I maybe introduce it to some patients who are far along in the in the ED pathway, they'll say, "Oh no, I, I don't want an implant." And and I hear them, I do. But if, if sometimes this may be the only treatment patients have, and it's it's a good one. I mean, it takes us about an hour to put in. Uh, you go home the same day, and then uh, a few weeks later, we activate it, and and generally it's good. The risks with this uh, to to know about, uh, just like any artificial knee, artificial hip artificial heart valve in the body, there is a risk of infection about one to 2.5%. Um, and, and, you know, 
if, if as long you know diabetics or renal transplant patients hiv is anyone immunocompromised slightly higher risk but we we really optimize that but there is but that risk and then because there's fluid moving back and forth in the inflatable penile implant it can pop a leak like your car tire can the risk of that is six percent at seven years so 94 percent of these will still work seven years after implantation which is great um and then People will say, when do I put a malleable in as opposed to inflatable? I think inflatable is, is generally what we do. But it, let's say some a patient, I, I, I just recently saw I had Parkinson's, his hands moved a lot. If, he, if you can't grab the, uh, the pump, then I, I want to give you something you can use, right? So that's a patient or if someone's super obese a lot of times where they can't even reach their scrotum. I think a malleable implant makes a little more sense. So there's some cases, but generally the inflatable is, 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 is the way that, that we go. Um, and I mean, it's, it's, I think it's a great surgery. I think 96 to 98% patient and partner satisfaction, um, and, and something to, to certainly, uh, consider. Um, one other thing that I want to bring up, um, just before I, I open the floor to questions. So, um, one thing that I think is, as, as a urologist who specialize, I, I only see male patients essentially that, that I, I'm trying to do a better job of remembering is that it's, it's all that, you know, when we have intercourse, it, it's, you know, a lot of times male, female, if, if, if that is, if that is what it's going to be, um, there, there's patient as women get older, they can be as what can call be called genital urinary syndrome of menopause. So there can be um, vaginal atrophy, there can be vaginal dryness. So you can have the hardest you know, erection possible with a penile implant. But if your partner is ha experiencing these symptoms, it can make it extremely tough to have sex. So this is something that, that you know, if, if there's any women tuning in today or any men who whose partners are uh, having such an issue, we, we have treatments for that as well. Some of my partners, Dr. Shea, Dr. Rotersheimer, uh, they specialize in, in, you know, such issues with vaginal atrophy, you know, lack of lubrication, recurrent UTIs. And this can be treated with a vaginal estrogen cream at the easiest or a probiotic. But we also have an innovative uh, technique called a Mona Lisa Touch. And so this is a laser treatment that uh, essentially makes uh, some, you can say, nicks in the vaginal mucosa has been shown to increase collagen production and uh, can increase lubrication to the penis. So, you know, it's it's key. You know, you can't sometimes fit a, 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 a square peg into a round hole. And so I think it's important, that, you know, as but when I see patients, I, I ask that question as well. And, and, you know, we can refer you to that. So that's something that, uh, you know, I, I don't want to forget to mention was that that's very important too. So, um, like I, you know, thank you so, so much. I, I sincerely appreciate everyone tuning in today. Um, I hope you learned something. Um, there's a variety of options. Uh, talk with your partner. It's, it's so critical and, uh, you know, come, come see us, come see me. I would, I would, I would love to, to, to see anyone and everyone and every, you know, everyone's story is unique and, uh, we, we, we want to find a solution for everyone. So, um, I have a lot of questions here. I want to just go through them. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, bring them any questions you have, please, please keep sending them. I'm just going to, uh, kind of go through those. So, all right. First question, is there an ideal level of testosterone you like to see? Okay. So, uh, from the sexual medicine society guidelines, we aim for a testosterone when we're repleting from 450 to 650. That's the middle tertile of where testosterone should, should range when patients are on testosterone replacement. Now, when you're talking about someone who I'm seeing just what their level of testosterone is, the, 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 the lab essentially will say anything below 300 is low, anything above 300 is normal. I think there's a bit of an art to medicine. I don't think ever anything is black or white. So I think that um, if a patient is, you know, values 350 and they feel great, they're, you know, no problems, you know, like from the libido's good, you know, they're not putting on weight, I may leave it. But if I have a, you know, a, a 39 year old male who comes in with a testosterone of 303 and has no sex drive and his marriage is falling apart. I mean, I'll replete his testosterone, you know, absolutely. So I think there's a bit of an art to that, but, um, you know, so, so it depends, uh, you know, 450 to 650 if you're uh, repleting and then, uh, you know, about 300, but you know, it, it, it is a bit of a, a, a leeway there. Next, what causes low libido? Great question. I think like low testosterone is definitely one of them. Um, a lot of times it can be medications. So some psychiatric medications I've seen that patients say for anxiety, depression, um, 
some sleeping pills like trazodone has been shown to do that. If patients have metastatic prostate cancer and they have some of these drugs that eliminate your testosterone, which they have to do to get the prostate cancer under control, their libido can go real low. Um, then, you know, it can be other causes like your thyroid. So, I mean, if, if your testosterone is normal and I may have you go see your primary care doctor, please look, you know, look at your thyroid, depression, anxiety. So there's, there's many causes, but what we, you know, I, I hone in on low libido for is low testosterone can absolutely be it. Um, will this have anything to do with an enlarged prostate? That is a, that's a great question. I think that um, things sometimes go hand in hand, reason being that a 20-year-old male does not have an enlarged prostate. Enlarged prostate happens a lot of times when the cumulative effect of testosterone on your prostate throughout your life. So it's something that we see in guys 50, 60 years old, and that's also where we see erectile dysfunction. So I'm not convinced that they lead to each other. They, they coexist. So it's, it's correlation, not causation. So um, um, next. Can penile length and girth be restored? That 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 that's a very interesting question. Um, so penile length, um, I think as we get older, a lot of times in patients with erectile dysfunction, you can start seeing some loss in penile length. I think that, and there's a good study from Paul Perito's group in Miami, which talks about that every year erectile dysfunction is left under treated or untreated. You can have uh, half a centimeter of penile length loss up to a few centimeters. And the reason for this, we think, is that you're not getting good oxygenated blood flow into the penis, and it starts scarring down, what we call corporal fibrosis. So um, can this be restored? Uh, generally speaking, penile length is a difficult thing to restore. There are some people trying some innovative things that, that are, I, I don't, they're not ready for prime time. We can just put it at that. Now, girth is, the other question was, can girth be restored? So this is where I think potentially the answer to this one is yes. So there is a new treatment on the market called Penuma. We are not offering it right now, but I'm I'm, I'm looking at the data very closely and, and it, it may be coming, honestly speaking. You know, I, once it's like, like with the penile shock, I'm, I'm not going to offer something I can't fully stand behind, but when it's ready, I, I, I may, we may do it. And so this is a, uh, essentially a, a cap that they put on the top side of the penis is through a surgical incision. And that's been shown to help definitely increase girth. And some of the pictures show that patients think that the, the length is better too. So something to consider. And then, um, so, so this is an ongoing uh, thing. Now, one thing to remember is, so, the, so one of the penile implant companies, Boston Scientific, they have a, uh, th their implant is called an LGX. It's a length and girth enhancement. So when you were going from a Flaccid penis to an inflated penis, you do see a little bit of girth enhancement and maybe a centimeter, centimeter and a half of length enhancement. So the penile implant that we that I do put in can sometimes help a little bit too. So, you know, uh, good, good, great question. Um, Almaduo insurance, we talked about that. Okay, here we go. I've been to a urologist for ED before and they never diagnose the problem, just prescribe meds. Do you do an injection test or some other test? Okay, great question. Um, so, so I think that there are some... Uh, physicians who will do penile Doppler. That's what this, pa this patient is asking about routinely. Um, and, and that can, essentially what that tells you is what's the blood flow in, blood flow out, but it still may not really tell you, like if, if you have diabetes, let's say, that may not tell you if that's the issue. So a lot of times I will tell you, I, I maybe, you know, and my, this was my training with, with Ken Angermite at the Cleveland Clinic, we did not do many penile Dopplers because it did not a lot of times, unless it's a trauma patient with an arterial problem, it did not change my management for the patient. But it can sometimes be a bit of a traumatic test because you're getting an injection in the penis and you need another one to bring it down. You have someone doing an ultrasound in your penis and you may not, no one can tell you, oh, it was this. They'll just say, okay, your blood flows less, but I know that already. If you have erectile dysfunction, there is a blood flow problem. I can tell you that without putting two to three needles in your penis. So I'd say yes and no, but I would say for me, generally, me, that's just my personal practice. I don't do many, but some of my partners do. And, and in their hands, they do a great job and, and it helps them. So, so you know, and, and that's why I love medicine and urology. It's, it's an art. It's an absolutely an art. And, and everyone, uh, you know, brings their own perspective and their own training into it. And, and that's great. Um, I'm in my mid-60s. Erection is usually not a problem, but sensitivity is to the point that orgasm is almost rare. Is there any help for this? Okay, great question. Well, few things. What we know is that um, as men get older, the amount of ejaculate 
uh, can definitely decrease because the prostate knows as men are getting older, they're not trying to have kids. So that function that can, can kind of uh, whittle down a little bit. Now, orgasm a lot of times is predicated by it's a mental thing. So like we know this from patients who have prostate removal, they can't ejaculate anymore. The prostate's gone, but they can still have orgasm in, in you know, in, in situations. So this is a, it's a lot of times mental. So the testosterone level is one thing I would look at here. And there's New, there's newer, there's medicine called cabergoline, uh, which is a psychiatric medication, which there's two studies behind that say that may help with orgasm. Um, so, so you know, there's, there's certain things, but maybe you can say it's a little preliminary, but, but I, I have certainly given it to patients and had some success. Um, does ultrasound work after having plication for Peyronie's disease? Another great question. So I essentially, I mean, what, what they're asking is, does this Alma Duo help with Peyronie's? Um, what we know on this, the data for this is in the, in the American Urologic Association guidelines, Peyronie's disease causing pain, you give those patients non steroidal anti-inflammatories, or you can offer penile shockwave. But um, for decreasing the curvature, they've tried it, but the data is not mature on that. I, 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 I do know... Uh, there are studies ongoing for this, but I, I don't think it has been proven yet. Um, now, if you've had a plication for Peyronie's, I mean, if the curve is back, I'm not convinced that the the, the Alma Duo is going to be the, the the answer here. But um, it, you know, we, we, there's other options for sure, like another plication. If your erections aren't as good anymore, a penile implant would would do the job. So um, you know, something to come talk to to talk to us about. Any long-term side effects from the implant? Yep, great question. So, so I think um, very rarely. I mean, I, I I can think of you know in my few years, that, you know, when fellowship and and being here, that one patient had persistent pain after the implant, and we actually took it out and never really under. He didn't have an infection. I sent it. I mean, it wasn't that. So that's one, but very rare. I mean, and then uh, you know, like I said, the one to two point five percent chance of infection, like any implant in the body, can have hip, knee, anything like that. And then the risk that the fluid leaks out, and it's just saline in there, nothing toxic to the body. So that uh, you know is what they give if you're dehydrated in the ER. If that leaks, then that's um, a potential side effect. But you don't see the side effect, like for instance, with injections or vagar, where the erection lasts too long and you end up in the ER needing a pr a, a procedure to bring the erection down. That's not going to be an issue. So, um, but th those are generally the main effects. Any risk of the ultrasound Alma Duo may dislodge any plaque that may be in the arteries. That, that is a, that is a great question. Um, we have not seen that yet. No, um, it, it, we we have not seen that it has dislodged any plaque um, and and caused you know what 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 I guess this patient may be worried about is what's called a, a you know a ischemic attack or a stroke. But no, the, none none in all the studies randomized trials we we have not seen that luckily. Any study using TENS therapy on the penis? Um, not that I'm aware, not that I'm aware, but I, I have to look into that, but, but I mean, I'm sure there, there may be, but I, not that I have seen you know, in any of our meetings that or that, that has great, gained much traction. How much do implants cost insurance? Yeah, great question. Um, this is something that, you know, come see me and we'll go through it, but um, we run it with our billing department and just, you know, us doing, you know, me, me and, you know, some of my partners doing a high volume of this. Uh, we, we can do some things to kind of push it through. Um, generally speaking, Medicare will cover the implant and a lot of commercial carriers, especially if you like, let's say you've had prostate cancer, it comes under this umbrella of prostate cancer survivorship, and it can be covered more easily. Medicaid, we've seen generally will not cover it. But like I said, um, I, I we, we just doing so many, we, we are, we have ways to hopefully try to help, you know, get, get it through uh, if, if you're a right candidate, because I, I really think it can help. I, I've seen it just change people's life and their relationships. It's, it's powerful. Um, with the Almadu, if it works after the six treatments, how long does the effectiveness last? Okay, so this is, this is I think, the, the, a great question. Um, it's kind of the million dollar question right now in the field, I think, because what, what we know is that barring, besides the penile implant, every other therapy is a medical therapy that, you know, as we get older, right, like a patient may get diabetes, their diabetes may get worse. There are other confounding factors. So while the Alma Duo may help, let's say you, you're getting older by the day. And so that, that's something that I, it's, we're having a hard time answering, like, will this make it so your erections, you know, what it was 10 years earlier? Maybe not, but it may delay you going on to more sub, you know, invasive treatments like a penile implant. What the current, what we're looking at is, 
you know, you do the six therapy uh, treatments and then you have a good uh, response. What then now studies looking at, do you need like a touch up for instance, right? So if, you know, people get Botox in their face for, for wrinkles, yeah, you go back six months later to get more Botox, right? It's not as if you got the Botox and then you're, you're you know, you're ready to, to you know, you're, you're, you're good. So we, and, and we are seeing that the one to two touch up treatments may be needed, but once again, th these studies are ongoing and we'll see, but um, I, it's hard to, to answer the, the only answer, and I can't answer that for Viagra even, I'll tell you, or injections. The only answer for how long does something last, the penile implant, why? Because I put a device in and it takes out all the other things from the patient's hands, like whether your diabetes gets worse, whether your heart disease gets worse, that implant is going to work, you know, for, uh, I, I know 94% of them will work seven years after implantation. And, and it, it's not affected by your aging and your comorbidities. But the other things, it's, it's hard to answer that question. Um, will, it, will it work on Peyronie's disease? Like I answered that we, we, at this point, not we don't have the data. Can the Almadua treatments be done in the evening? Um, I think at this time, it's not evening. I think late afternoon, we have some appointments around four, but um, that's that's a good uh, thought. I mean, I'll pass that along. It's something that if, if that we have enough traction, I think we could you know, make that potentially available. <clears throat> What's the usual percentage of men who experience ED following cyber knife radiation? I'm 73, but both my urologists and GI docs say I'm more like 53. Okay, so cyber knife is a type of external beam radiation therapy. Um, and so uh, what we know is that 45 to 55% of patients may experience some type of erectile dysfunction after radiation therapy for prostate cancer. Um, and so, uh, and, and I, once again, this, the uh, various studies will, will, will change that number, but, but, and, and the difference is that after surgery for prostate cancer, you will see the erection issues kind of right away in the first 12 months or so. And then they may get better because the nerves are stunned during surgery and then they, you get Wallerian regeneration and they get better. Now, in radiation therapy, at first, patients do great with the erections and they don't see anything, but it's generally two to three years later that you may see some of these issues and uh, and kind of arise, and, and that's when um, we, we treat that. One other thing that I want to uh, just, just uh, say is patients after prostate cancer treatment may also get urinary incontinence and leakage where um, when you cough and sneeze, you may leak urine. Um, that's something we didn't go into today, but this is kind of a little different, but we have some good solutions for that. There's an artificial urinary sphincter that we can put in. And that sometimes that goes hand in hand with erectile dysfunction. And if that's an issue, I like to treat the incontinence first because you want to get the patient dry. It's hard to have sex if you're leaking on your partner. And so we did over 40 of those procedures last year. Uh, that's a reconstructive urology procedure to help, you know, essentially get this, the, you know, recreate the sphincter mechanism, but something that, that, you know, please come see me if that's an issue. Um, how do we find where we are in the ED spectrum? I think just come in and see me for an appointment and, and, you know, we, we kind of go through some you know, a history and physical and we can decide. Um, does the medical doctor administer the shockwave therapy? Um, so it, it's administered by my staff who's been well-trained on this. It, it is not us uh, doing the, this, but the initial consultation will uh, be with uh, my, my PA uh, in the men's health clinic, who is once, I mean, just exceptional and, and knows all the data and, and who we should be doing it on inside and out. And I, I'm always open to appointments to come discuss it further and really um, I, I love taking a, a deep dive into the, the science behind it and the data and, and happy to answer any questions. So please come in. Um, are DHEA supplements beneficial? Um, no, no randomized trials that I've seen on this. I have some patients who swear by, but, but not that something that I routinely advise. Um, okay, we answer that one. Yeah, so a lot of these are how long does Alma Duo last? And that was the effectiveness. Okay, is Almaduo treatment effective on men in the late 60s? So it's not, I don't think it's more to do with age, actually. The, uh, the data is showing it's more to do with where you are on the spectrum. So I think if you have some response to Viagra or Cialis, I think that you, and, and you know, and you have, let's say you haven't had a prostatectomy. So, right, there's four studies on patients who have prostatectomy. 
it's not ready there, so I wouldn't offer it there. But as long as you know it, you, you're re responding to Viagra or Cialis, regardless of age, generally, I think Almadul is something to to potentially consider. Absolutely. Um, I'm four months post prostate removal with left nerve sparing, doing a vacuum four to five times a week. Awesome, very good. Sildenafil, uh, but no reaction so far. Should I pursue other treatments now or be patient? Um, Great question. Um, so, so generally what we see is that after prostatectomy, it's actually the three to four months out is when actually things erection wise are at their worst. So I, I want you to not lose hope. You're doing all the right things. Keep the vacuum going, stay on the sildenafil. That's helping bring blood flow to the penis. I would not recommend Alma Duo or anything like that at this time in your situation. Um, I think you should continue this, but, uh, generally 12 to 18 months after prostatectomy is when we see, okay, where do we stand? Okay. And then we may go down whatever route, but I, I think right now, unfortunately, I mean, is, is where it may be the worst, actually the three to four month period. And it's, it may start getting better now, so, but you're doing all the right things. Would a 70 year old be a candidate uh, so with Peyronie's and ED be a worthy candidate for wave therapy or is penile implant the best option? Great question. It depends on the degree of curvature of the Peyronie's and how bad your erectile dysfunction is. Um, if the erectile dysfunction is, is pretty severe and you're not responding well to sildenafil and Cialis and your curve is very severe, then I think a penile implant to me makes the most sense. Now, if your curve is like five degrees, like barely perceptible, you're able to penetrate during sex, there's no pain to your partner, and then your erections are quite good, then Maybe Alma Duo is fine because the intent of the Alma Duo then is not really to cure the Peyronie's. It's to help with the erections because the Peyronie's is, you know, subclinical or below 30 degrees, which generally for us is, is you know, what we say is kind of the mild Peyronie's. So um, it just depends. So can you come in and see us so we can really parse through that information and decide what, what is good is, uh, for you? Because like I said, every year you let erectile dysfunction kind of fester, you're losing penile length. And that's something you generally cannot get back. And, you know, what I tell patients who are kind of on the fence, let's say for a penile implant, okay, if you're going to do it today versus five years from now, if you were going to do it regardless, it's better to go today because five years from now, you're going to have at least lost two and a half centimeters of penile length that you're not going to get back. But, and, and you're five years older, maybe you, you're, you know, in a wheelchair and can't even get it because you can't use your hands. You know, I mean, things change in our life. So I think that, you know, burying your head in the sand and not addressing it is, is a lot of times can be detrimental to us as men. So, um, um, I suffer from PTSD, conversion to addictive depression, men's anxiety meds four times a day. I didn't see a question with that. Okay. But I mean, certainly some of the depression, anxiety meds can precipitate erectile dysfunction, but I would never tell anyone to go off those without discussing with your psychiatrist. I mean, you know, mental health is absolutely critical and, and you know, we, 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 we work in conjunction with our colleagues for that. Have you had success in restoring nerves damaged by prostatectomy? So like I said, four studies of Alma Duo on prostatectomy patients, three of them showed no benefit. One is equivocal, uh, meaning maybe, maybe not. So what I tell patients is, can I stand behind it? No. Uh, but, you know, I've had a few patients who say, you know what, I'm still going to try it because like I said, the main thing is there's no side effect in the sense you're not going to get worse. And so They've tried it and, and you know, I, 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 I'm, it's still plus minus. I mean, I think that we, I, I just depends. I mean, I, I think at this point we can't stand behind that. Um, can a penis that has been curved since puberty still be caused by Peyronie's? Great question. This is a different clinical scenario. A curvature since puberty is not Peyronie's. This is called cordy or congenital penile curvature. It's totally different. This is not a scar tissue problem. This is more that the corpora that we were talking about, they grow at different rates. So for instance, if one side grows longer than the other, it curves, bang, you get a left or right would curve. So that is is generally that needs a surgical fix you can't do a you know a restorex or inject xiaflex that's a you do a plication where you essentially took some stitches in the long side of the penis uh, the you know against the, the other and, and you crank it back the other way so it takes about 30 minutes and, and we can we can do that but that's the that that's the nuance to the men's health that, that we, we uh, that i love seeing so it's a little different actually than the treatment's a little different uh i'm about a year and a half ago had an accident 
when inserting my penis and had a misalignment. And after a amount of time, my penis became curved. I do think I have scar tissue. I really want it. I don't want to take medicine because of side effects. What is the best choice resolving the issue? Um, yeah, so sounds like this patient had, you know, maybe a subclinical penile fracture. And that a lot of times can be also what precipitates the Peyronie's. Um, you know, if you don't want to take medicine and you're out of what we you know, call the active phase of the disease over about six months out um, and there's no pain associated with it, if you absolutely don't want medicine such as Zyaflex, you want to avoid surgery, sometimes that Restorex device where you straighten the penis uh, with that machine, you know, that device can, can help and, um, you know, come in and see us. But I think that that may be in, in your case what we want to do. But it also depends. I mean, if you have a 120 degree curve that's curving where is it? on it back on itself, that you may get 15 to 20 degrees, but if you get down to 90, you still can't penetrate. So it depends on what the curvature is before we decide that that's the way to go. But that's the way, the Restrex is the way to go without medicines or, or uh, surgery. What method of delivery is most ideal for testosterone therapy? Um, that, that th There's no ideal way. I think each patient responds differently. In, in our pathway that we do, we start in most cases, um, if the patient wants fertility with a pill called Clomid or a solution, a topical solution. And then if we, we check the labs pretty stringently, and then if there's issues, then we can kick it up to a pill or to uh, injections or a cream. So I mean, it, it, it's, it's, there's no ideal way. Each, everyone just kind of responds a little different. What causes sporadic climaxes? Have one one time and can't get another time. Feels like you're going too often and then goes away. Um, Sporadic climaxes, yeah. I, I, I mean, I think that a lot of times this can it, there. There's a, it's something called genital arousal syndrome, very rare, but um, where patients can have spontaneous orgasms, um, uh, and and generally we can some give some medications for that. But but like I said, quite rare. Um, then a lot of times it can be a, a mental thing. You know, if if you're very stressed out, it's hard to ejaculate an orgasm sometimes. And, and you know, we experience that at times too. So um, it, it can be, that, that's multifactorial. Um, and results. Okay, so someone asked, what are the results? So uh, there's there's a validated questionnaire called the IIEF score. That's a erectile dysfunction score that's based on a scale of, of one to 25. What the randomized controlled trials have shown is that on average, there's a two to four point increase in IIEF scores um, with with uh, alma duo therapy. So so you know it it certainly uh, is validated in in placebo controlled randomized trials to uh, help with erectile dysfunction. Climacteria after radical prostate removal. Great question. Climacteria is where when you orgasm, you urinate a little bit. And there's a, um, if, if you have concomitant um, uh, erectile dysfunction after radical prostatectomy and you're leaking during sex, there's a new innovative treatment called the mini jupette sling. And so this is where at the time I, I'll put a penile implant in and we'll put a sling actually right across the urethra. So when you pump up the implant, it tightens the urethra and then you won't pee. And so this came out a few years ago from a group in France. And so um, I've, we, we offer that. It's a kind of, you know, a pretty specialized treatment, but just uh, I, I think in the right patient, it, 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 it works like a charm. So, so absolutely come, come in and see me. I would, I would love to help with that. Um, I am 57. There's good health. No other man's way. This is, what is the data long for the, so the long-term effects. Yeah. costs we went through. How do high or low estrogen levels in men affect ED? That's a great question. So what we see is that patients who um, are generally more obese may have increased estrogen levels. That's because the fat cells, the adipose cells will convert testosterone, testosterone to estrogen. And that can sometimes cause issues with gynecomastia, um, hot flashes, things like that. So if the estrogen level is high, there's actually some treatments when, when I'm repleting testosterone that I will do to decrease that. And that will essentially, well, essentially I cut, we cut off the enzyme that converts testosterone to estrogen and that shunts it back the other way and that will actually increase your testosterone, which then can 
you know, if your testosterone is good for an obese man, they may be able to exercise more. They feel more uh, vigorous, rigor, you know, they can go to the gym. And so it kind of really helps the man as a whole. It's, it's, it's absolutely key. So you know that I, I check estrogen or est estradiol levels uh, when I replete testosterone. If you're on chronic Pain meds and have a dorsal column stimulator is the ultrasound wave therapy an option. Have intolerance to testosterone therapy. Yes, um, yep, it, it would be an option. Chronic pain meds and even a, a, a spinal cord stimulator, it's it's not going to cause an issue because it's a focal shock wave that goes into the corpora of the penis. So so please, you know, give us a call and, and let's take a look. Um, I had the Eurolift procedure. Will the acoustic therapy have an impact on that? So no evidence that uh, it causes any problems with any previous prostate procedure. Eurolift is for enlarged prostate. Um, the, uh, the, the the ultrasound wave therapy is on the penis. The prostate is actually pretty deep inside the perineum, and, and it should not cause a problem with that. Uh, I wonder if some of the medications I take have an effect on ED. I just feel some of the medicine I take, Wellbutrin in particular. Yeah, Wellbutrin potentially. But like I said, I would never ask you to stop it with, the, until we have a discussion with your primary care, your psychiatrist who may be um, prescribing it. Do vitamins help with ED? Um, once again, few studies on this, nothing randomized. There are some anecdotal things that people will talk about, but, but nothing that I routinely recommend or can stand behind is what I would say. Um, if you decide to move forward with injection therapy for ED, um, try the injections at home. Do you need to try injections or do you need to try the first dose in the medical office to get the dosage correct? Um, okay, so American Urologic Association guidelines will talk about uh, that the first injection or, you know, until you're comfortable, we do in the office. Um, that being said, I, I do have patients who, and I get it, they, they don't want to do it in the office because it's it's awkward. You know, you're in this exam room, this sterile room with this uh, you know, bearded guy that, you know, you may, you don't know that well. And so they, they, they do it, they do it at home. And, you know, as long as they understand and they're well-educated, I, I, I will, you know, sometimes say that's okay. But per the guidelines, we do a lot of times like to do it in the office first. What is the effect on blood flow to the glands once the implant is placed? Since it's not a normal blood flow, does it leave it cold like an erection with a pump? Great question. Um, so the blood flow, um, you still have blood flow through the urethra. So there's three components to the penis, the two paired structures where the implants placed, and then the corpus spongiosum, the urethra. And that's what provides a lot of the blood supply to the head of the penis. Um, so yes, I mean, at times the, the, um, the glands may be cold, but it's, you know, it's, it's, I, I have not had many patients really complain about that. I think there's two approaches to a penile implant. If you go from above the infrapubic approach, and if there's an injury, sometimes there has been reported cold gland syndromes, once again, very rare. But a lot of times if patients, uh, you know, use a vacuum device, you can use it actually sometimes with the penile implant, and you get a bit of blood flow into the head of the penis, and then you inflate the implant that can trap some blood in the head, and then you're good to go. So that's an interesting new study that Paul Perito out of Miami has talked about, and um, something, you know, if patients have an issue, I, I do recommend. If the, if the implant becomes infected, can the infection be treated without implant removal? Generally, the answer to that is no, um, because if the implant is infected, that means that there's a biofilm of bacteria on the implant, and so you have to take it out. Now, if you have a superficial infection at the incision, what we call a surgical site infection that looks very different, you're not having fevers, chills, just a little bit of redness, yes, we can treat it with antibiotics many times. But if there's pus, drainage, you're having fevers, chills, you got to take the thing out, um, and, and, and yeah, that's the safe and the right thing to do. Um, any treatments that will work with someone with MS? Yeah, great question. So like, let's talk about any neurologic disease, MS, Parkinson's, ALS. These a lot of times can, can cause um, some erectile dysfunction. So um, generally, I mean, you know, we, we can try Viagra, Cialis, things like that. And if they don't work, then, you know, injections are an option. But with MS or Parkinson's, you know, patients may have issues with their hands. So they may need a partner who's willing to help inject them. And then the penile implant is, is a great option, but in someone who has limited hand dexterity, I like to put the, the malleable because you don't have to find the pump and inflate it. And, you know, you can just, uh, you know, put the put the rods up and, and, and you're ready to go. And, and one thing I tell patients, it's not irreversible. If we do the malleable implant and you don't like it, the rigidity is not good enough or whatever, and you want to do the, the three piece penile, the inflatable, we can do it. I mean, it's, it's never, it's, uh, it's never a dead end, you know? So that's something that 
uh, we can we can always consider. And one other thing, just to, all these penile implants, no one will know you have it. Uh, we make it, you know, we conceal it very well. If you're in a locker room, it's it's it, no one will know. It's MRI safe. There are times I even get an MRI of a penile implant, uh, and um, it's not going to set off a, a metal detector in an airport. So you're 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 good to go. Um, How do you find out if your estrogen level is high? That's a blood test that we do. Um, lisinopril, does it contribute to ED? Some evidence that lisinopril may have some association with ED, but once again, I would never ask someone to stop it. That needs to be discussed with your uh, primary care doctor before we do. Um, food, fruits and fr vegetables can be good, that are red can be good for ED, any opinion? I've made, I've heard that too. Once again, I've not seen any studies on that, but hey, look, vegetables, good. Keep it up. Yep. Uh, since my insurance won't cover the Alma Duo, how much do I expect to pay? So uh, just to say that again, there's six treatments. That's what all those randomized trials did. So we're, we're recreating that. Um, it's $400 a session, but if you pay for all six up front, the fifth one's free. So it's $2,000 for uh, six sessions. Um, Will the regular long-term use of a vacuum erection device prevent age-related penile length reduction? Amazing question. Um, this is something that I'm interested in. I, I think the answer, there's no studies. I think the answer may be yes on this, um, that because the vacuum erection device is helping increase blood flow to the penis. And so if you can do that, that I think that the, the lack of blood flow, oxygenated blood flow to the penis is what brings the corporal fibrosis into play. So the reason that I think this is the answer to this is yes, is when I get referred patients who've had previous penile implant infections and they want another in, in implant put in, I will put them on a vacuum erection device to help bring blood flow in so that we can get through some of that scar tissue from the previous infection that they had with, with, with you know, another urologist and they're referred for me to do a complex case. So um, a lot of times, I think that that helps. And now in patients who have had prostatectomy, we do know that sometimes they uh, prostate removal, they may have loss of length. So like one, I answered a question, some uh, a guy is using the vacuum device. I think that is something I put patients on after prostatectomy is I think that helps to bring blood flow to the penis and may um, decrease penile length reduction. And you know, a lot of times before a penile implant, there's some evidence, I've seen some papers where if you do the vacuum erection device, before surgery, you may be able to get a, a centimeter or two extra length with the penile implant. So I'm, I, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Um, it's difficult to get an appointment, and I didn't catch. My name is Doctor uh, Purush Babar. Call in, say you watch the webinar, and uh, the, the the call center is going to know that uh, we we, we got to get 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 everyone in. Um, talking. What is the cost of the penile injections? And do you carry this in the pharmacy at urology group? Um, currently on sales with 70% success during activity. Okay. Um, the injections we do not cover. That is That also depends on your insurance. Um, there's a few compounding pharmacies, some around town, some in Columbus, you know, Michigan. They mail it to you. Um, and each one of us kind of may have a different one. I, I use a pharmacy, SHB Medical, out of uh, Columbus that um, I, I like it because I can really like a tinker with the dosage. And I, 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 I'm, I'm big on that. So, um, you know, but, but we all have a different one and, and, but not our pharmacy, unfortunately does not cover that. Um, are you familiar with a device called the a Phoenix claims to help with ED? I, I am not familiar with that one actually. So, um, I don't think it's approved at least by the FDA that, that I know of and something that I haven't heard. So, um, I've been in your group two times for ED and never had my T level tested and have been prescribed. Meds, do you recommend being tested? I do also have Peyronie's disease and would like to further talk on options. Yeah, come in and see us. I think um, generally we will test testosterone, but if if you, um, you know, your libido is very good, you're feeling, you know, fine. A lot of times some practitioners may bypass that, but I think that if you're still struggling with erectile dysfunction, getting a, a, a testosterone, early morning testosterone is, is never a bad idea and can really um, help, you know, just risk stratify a little more. So um, I think that's it. We, we got through all the questions. So thank you so much for tuning in today. Um, here is uh, our, our, our phone number. Um, so give us a call. Um, 
come come you know see me i would i would love to to have a conversation about this or uh you know any anything you know men's health related uh chronic testicular pain urethral stricture premature ejaculation i mean please please come and and um let's 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 take ownership of your health and let's do it together and be partners in in this and yeah be proactive so thank you so much i hope everyone has a good evening and uh yeah signing off thank you <laughs>